Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin, and these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. They couldn't enter into the promised land without being exposed to both a blessing if they were obedient and a curse if they were disobedient. There was no way into the promised land but through that. And then 12 curses are listed. Now we will not go into them in detail, but I'll just read the first. The Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the one who makes any carved or molded image an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. All Israel had to invoke upon themselves a curse if they became involved in idolatry, in worshipping false gods, or in what we call in modern English the occult. That's the first and primary cause of curses in people's lives is involvement in idolatry, the worship of false gods, and the whole realm of the occult. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, the first commandment, the Lord said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall make no graven image to worship. And he said, if you do, I will require it of the three following generations. It will not only be visited on you, but on the three subsequent generations. So you understand that you may be struggling with something in your life here tonight, which is due to your grandfather or even your great-grandfather or your great-grandmother or some other ancestor. Do you see how important it is to diagnose and identify the problem? I'll just summarize the other main causes of curses listed here in Deuteronomy chapter 27. First of all, as I've said, idolatry and false gods. Second, dishonoring parents. And that's very, very important. I don't doubt that there are some of you here tonight who have problems in your life because your attitude to your parents is not right. Remember the first commandment with a blessing is the opposite. Honor thy father and mother that it may be well with thee and that it, thou mayest live long on the earth. I want to tell you in all my experience in Christian ministry, I have never met a person who dishonored father and mother and had it well with them. Never. I don't believe such a person exists. It automatically exposes you to a curse. Now, I don't mean you have to agree with your parents or even do everything they tell you to do. That depends on the way your parents are living. But you have to honor them as your parents. It's the first commandment with a promise of blessing. You understand? I don't know how many people I've met whose lives have been straightened out when they straightened out their attitude to their parents. And I, I think of others who never did it and who never were blessed. I think of one member of my family who's dead. He died of cancer at the age of 40. His, he was saved, baptized in the Spirit, and served the Lord. But he never enjoyed the blessing of God because he never put right his relationship with his mother, who was a spiritist. So he had all the problems you can imagine, but he could have escaped from them if he dealt with his relationship with his mother. See, I'm not talking about theories. I'm talking about things that I know from experience. The next reason for curse is illicit or unnatural sex. Any form of unnatural sex brings a curse. Any form of homosexuality or bestiality will bring a curse. Also, sexual relationships with members of your family that are outside the permitted range. Uh, and today we have to acknowledge the fact that there are millions of children who are victimized by their fathers in the area of sex. Then the fourth main reason is injustice to the weak and helpless. In my whole series of tapes, I deal with the fact that American Indians in the United States, 
placed a curse on the White House because the American government regularly broke its treaties with the American Indians. And believe me, they know how to curse. They surely do. That's why from 1860 until 1980, every president elected in the 20th year died in office. You can trace that back to two things. The American government's unfaithfulness to the American Indians and the fact that Abraham Lincoln, who was the president elected in 1960, permitted an, a spiritist seance to be conducted in the White House by his wife, who later ended in a mental institution. So you see how this thing just doesn't affect individuals, it affects whole nations. Now I believe that the same would have happened to President Reagan as you know, he was attempted, an attempt was made on assassinating him early in his presidency. But just before he took the oath as president, a group of us in a large meeting combined in prayer and faith and released him from the curse. Not just him, but broke the curse over the presidency. And you see how near the curse came to being fulfilled? The bullet lodged within one inch of his heart. But I believe that was God's, in a sense, vindication of the prayer that released the curse. Do you see? I hope you can see that this is no abstract theory. This is something that affects lives of people and nations everywhere. Then another completely different kind, Jeremiah 17, verses 5 and 6. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm or his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. And this is the curse, listen. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. See, that's typical of a person under a curse. Everybody else is getting the rain, the blessing, the prosperity, but he in the midst of it all lives in a parched land and never sees it. Why? Because it's a curse. What's the cause of that curse? Cursed is the man who trusts in man, makes flesh his arm, relies on human ability and material resources, and whose heart departs from the Lord. Now I believe that curse rests over many Christian churches, which have tasted of the grace of God, <laughs> known what it is to be blessed by his grace, but then have turned away and begun trusting in their own efforts, their own intelligence, their own religion. They'd made flesh their arm. The blessing of God has lifted, and in its place a curse has come over those congregations. I've preached in many congregations, but I was assured we're under a curse. And you struggle, and you fight, and you preach, but there are very few results until the curse is dealt with. Without turning there, in Zechariah 5, Zechariah had a vision of a scroll that contained curses on both sides. One side was on the one who stole, and the other was on the one who perjured and swore falsely in the name of the Lord. And it, this curse entered into the houses of people and destroyed their houses. You see? A lot of houses are destroyed because a curse has come in. Families are broken up because of a curse. I wonder how many New Zealanders would be under a curse if you included all those who stole and perjured themselves. How many are not honest in their tax returns? <laughs> Do you realize that that could bring a curse on you? I tell you, in the United States, it would include a lot of people, and many of them would be churchgoers. Now, the next area of sources is men representing God. We just take a few. The first is Joshua. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 26, after the children of Israel had miraculously captured the city of Jericho, Joshua pronounced a, per a curse on anybody who would rebuild it. Joshua 6, 26. Then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. 
Think you found the new international version says he shall lay its foundation at the cost of his firstborn and at the cost of his youngest he shall set up its gates. Now that was pronounced round about 1300 or so before Christ, round about 800 before Christ, a man did that thing. We can read about that in 1st Kings chapter 16 verse 34. 1st Kings chapter 16 verse 34. In his days, the days of King Ahab, which is approximately four or five hundred years later, in his days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram his firstborn, and at the cost of his youngest son, Sigub, he set up its gates, according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken through Joshua the son of Nun. So five hundred years later, the curse pronounced by Joshua was worked out in that man who rebuilt the city. It cost him two of his children. Can you imagine the doctors of that day trying to find out the cause of their death? <laughs> no obvious medical reason. They just pined away. Can't find any virus. No known medical diagnosis and yet they die. The doctors didn't know that the cause went back 500 years, see, to a curse that had been pronounced by a man of God as a judgment on a city which God determined should never be rebuilt. Can you see that you may be dealing with things in your life of which the cause can go back hundreds of years? Another example is David's words in his song after the death of Saul and Jonathan in 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 21 and I have to say if you can take it in the right way David was a tremendous cursor <laughs> I don't mean in the sense we'd use it today but he pronounced some hair-raising curses on some people I mean you read some of the Psalms it makes your blood run cold just to think of it See, that's part of the ministry of a man of God. Men of God not merely bless, they also curse. All right, this is what he said in this beautiful song about Saul and Jonathan. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 21. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, nor let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. Is it, does it make sense to talk to mountains? Or do you think that's just something strange? Well, I want to tell you, those words were spoken about 1,000 years before Christ. And we're now nearly 2,000 years after Christ. You can go to the mountains of Gilboa and there is no green vegetation on them still today. Trees and vegetation will grow on every other mountain all around. And the government of Israel, which is very keen on reforesting the country, has tried to plant trees on that mountain and they wouldn't grow. What's the reason? Words spoken by David 3,000 years ago and the visible evidence is still there in the land of Israel today. That's real. If you don't, we don't need to turn there, but you remember the prophet Elisha had a servant named Gehazi. And Gehazi disobeyed Elisha, ran after Naaman after he'd been miraculously healed and asked for money and clothing and hid it from Elisha. And when he came back, Elisha said, didn't my spirit go with you? And then he said this, the leprosy of Naaman the Syrian cleave to thee and thy seed forever. And, Nehem, uh, and Gehazi went out a leper as white as snow. What was that the result of? A curse pronounced by a man of God. Turn to the New Testament and Jesus in Mark chapter 11. Beginning at verse 12. Now the next day when they, that's Jesus and the disciples, had come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. 
And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now I believe, I'm not going to say for absolute sure, that in that type of fig tree, before the figs come, there's a small kind of round thing that comes first, which the Arabs call nafal, which means that which falls. Jesus was not so unreasonable as to expect figs when it was not the time, but he did come from the nafal. But the, the teaching is that if a tree doesn't bring forth the nafal, the first preliminary thing, it will not bring forth figs either. And so Jesus knew that that tree was fruitless. And what did he do? He spoke to the tree. Does that make sense? In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. I'm sure they thought our master is just a little bit, uh, gone a little bit too far. Um, going on now to verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the frig fig tree dried up from the roots. Twenty-four hours later, the tree was totally dry. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Notice, he said to Jesus, you cursed it. That was the result. Jesus said, have faith in God. <laughs> and if you like to look just for one other passage, parallel passage in Matthew 21, verse 21, the same story it says in verse 20, well, when the disciples saw the tree, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree. What was done to the fig tree? It was cursed. But he said, you can also speak to a mountain. But notice, he authorized them to curse things. He said, you will not only do what is done to this fig tree. I tell you, the power we have, if we could but realize it, is frightening. <clears throat> We're really rather like Moses when God called him to go back to Egypt and deliver Israel. And he said, I don't have anything. What can I go with? And the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? He said, a shepherd's staff. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. And what happened? When it touched the ground, it became a snake. And Moses ran from the very thing he'd been holding in his hand. Understand? And God said, that's all you're going to need is your staff. Go back to Egypt and do the job. You see, a lot of us are like that. We're holding a staff in our hands. We don't realize that if we throw it on the ground, it can turn to a snake. Let me tell you a story. It's a true story. Um, about 1965, I was an uh, associate pastor in a church in Chicago. And right on the corner, flush with the church, wall to wall with the church, was a saloon, a pub, whatever you call them here. Not only did they sell alcohol, but it was a place of prostitution and a place of drugs, illicit drugs. And we were having a prayer meeting in the church sometime in October. And I was on the platform, one of those leading the prayer meeting. And without premeditation, I stood up on the platform and I said, in the name of Jesus, I curse that pub, that salute. And I didn't think much more about it. Just about Christmas time, I think just after Christmas, at 4 a.m., there was a phone call in our house. Brother Prince, the church is burning. Would you like to come and see it? Well, I, it's very cold in Chicago, and when at 4 a.m., it was probably 20 degrees below zero, I thought, no, I really don't want to go and see it. Then I thought, if I don't show any interest in the church burning, people will think I'm pretty indifferent. So Ruth, um, my first wife, Lydia, and I got into the car and drove down. And when we got near it, there were the flames up in the sky and the smoke rising in billows. But when we got there, we discovered it wasn't the church. It was the liquor store, the pub. But the wind was blowing off the lake, Lake Michigan. And you call Wellington Windy City. Let me tell you, Chicago is also called Windy City. It's very similar in that respect. And the wind was blowing the flames right onto the church. And as we got there, the wind changed 180 degrees and blew the flames in exactly the opposite direction, away from the church. The result was the, the, the pub was completely destroyed and the church suffered nothing but smoke damage. 
And the fire chief of the Chicago Fire Brigade said to one of the elders, he said, you people must have a special relationship with the man upstairs. <laughs> but that, you know what, that, what was the, that was the result of? A curse. When I saw what had happened, I thought, Brother Prince, you better be pretty careful how you pray from now on. I didn't, I was like Moses, I was scared by what I had in my hand, you understand? All right. Now, another source of curses, and this is very important, is people with relational authority. God has so ordered human society that in certain situations, one person has authority over another person or persons. The most obvious example is a father who, according to the Word of God, has authority over his family. Whether people like it or not, whether they fight it or not, is absolutely unimportant. The fact is, he has authority over his family. If he doesn't use it, that's his problem. Another person who has authority is a husband over his wife. They're very closely related. The Bible says, God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of the husband, the husband is the head of the woman. Women's labors can say what they like about it, but the fact remains it's true. and They can't change it by objecting to it. And I'm not anti-women, I think that's obvious. Never has been my problem. <laughs> I'm rem uh, I better not get into that. <laughs> Well, where are we? Yeah, let's take the, the case of Jacob and his family. Jacob had served for a long time, more than 14 years, with his uncle Laban. He'd acquired two.